Well, welcome to the November Tuesday topics and it's election day. I voted. I bet all of you have too or are going to do it quite soon. Uh, yes. Oh, me too. You do. <laughs> so we're the few, the proud and the ones that aren't uh, working at a polling place today. So quality audience for our speaker and guest today. Remind you again of, of our rules for our Zoom Tuesday topics. Remember to keep your audio muted. Uh, you can show yourself with your video or not, whatever you feel like. We will save our questions and answers uh, until the end so Zach can finish his presentation. Uh, and our VP, Mary Lou Davis, will moderate questions and answers. Put your questions in the chat box as they occur to you. And if you have a friend who's having trouble, which has been all of us today, uh, it seems like, um, they should email connect at tscpl.org for help. So it's election day today, hooray. And I just read that Topeka broke some records for early voting and vote by mail. So maybe that's a good sign and we will overcome some of the, the bad numbers we had in the primary. People are voting. Also, Richie McDonald sent me, um, I think a tweet from Seaman High School showing them uh, busing their students to the election office to early vote or their first chance to vote. And that reminded me again, that's thanks I believe to our volunteers who went into the schools and uh, talked to a whole lot of students in 501. Um, other announcements, um, it's dues time. And, uh, and uh, here we have Alan Foster, who is our great membership chairman. So uh, Alan will be sending you a note shortly about dues. And you can also check out uh, uh, our website to pay your dues online. Watch your email and the website for a link to register for statewide league day, which will be December 4th and it'll be virtual. So we won't have to travel one more time. Uh, in December, we're having our Shawnee County legislative delegation with us. That's always uh, an interesting one. And we're getting ready to go back and have a celebration of ourselves at the library in January with an in-person meeting. Anybody else have an announcement before we get started? Okay. Well, it is my pleasure um, to announce our guest speaker today. Uh, sometimes I don't actually read their whole um, introductions, but Zach's is so great, I'm gonna read it, okay. So Zach Pastora is an environmental champion. He's from Linwood, Kansas and a K-State graduate. His background is political science, women's studies and nonprofit leadership. He's applied his education toward improving public policy in Kansas as uh, being the Kansas lobbyist for the Sierra Club for 10 years. And he's proud of that as he should be. Zach also is doubling as the interim executive director for the Kansas Rural Center right now. So it's a great statewide group who I know well. Uh, they concentrate on rural life and sustainable food and farm systems. Outside of his advocacy, Zach likes to spend his time adventuring, watching sports and live music, and growing and selling organic vegetables. For Zach, the question is pretty simple. We all count on our environment every day, but can it count on us? So help me welcome Zach. Hey, good afternoon, uh, League of Women Voters, Topeka, and uh, fellow uh, comrades in, in making the world a better place. I really appreciate you having me here today for Tuesday Topics. And uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, Carol. And uh, and I got to give a shout out for Glennie, uh, who first called me uh, about uh, presenting before you today. So a special day as Election Day. Uh, wonderful to be able to celebrate it uh, with one of my favorite Kansas organizations, uh, increasing civic participation out there. It's a really good group. Uh, great to be in your company and all that you do uh, to help inform people, get them out to vote, but also keep them politically engaged. 
uh, there at the in Topeka State Legislature and, and other topics in their communities uh, and, uh, and uh, country. Um, I have a few slides that I wanted to uh, uh, show uh, because it's it's one thing to uh, hear the message uh, that I'll uh, present today, but it's, you know, pictures speak a thousand words and it's kind of a little bit more entertaining to have a few slides to help uh, show you a, a little bit of what we're talking about and talk about environmental issues generally and, uh, and, and the challenges, opportunities for us in Kansas. But before I begin, let me just say from the outset, I don't mean to start a uh, KUK State uh, rivalry here. Uh, I went to K-State proud Wildcat, but actually I was born the night of the KU National Championship in 88. Uh, one of the only babies, I think the only baby born in Lawrence that night, actually uh, during the game. Uh, so I think that's, uh, so I was uh, in, got Jayhawk uh, blood, I guess I would say, but uh, Bill Self wouldn't let me sit the bench there for the Jayhawks. So I ended up uh, going to K-State, uh, which I uh, uh, have a long uh, family legacy of uh, being a Wildcat, so it was all good. Uh, but don't let me overlook uh, uh, the Ichabods. My cousin went to uh, Washburn and all that, so uh, a lot of love for Kansas. I'm a lifelong Kansan, and uh, that was a big reason why I wanted to get into um, uh, public policy to help Kansas be a better place because uh, being a political science and kind of before political science, I did a policy debate in high school there for Tong and Oxy that uh, a tradition of uh, good debate programs. But, you know, I always uh, read in history growing up about how uh, government, specifically American government and democracy, uh, right, can uh, be an institution for positive change and impact in people's lives, right? That's why we vote. That's why we're uh, civically engaged in all that. Uh, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and, and do what we can to uh, provide a liberty and justice for all. Well, then you go back home and, you know, I live in the country and I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but you go back home and you hear about how crooked the government is and how slow and how can, they can't do anything. And uh, that probably applies whether you're urban or rural. But, you know, I thought, well, wait a second, how do you reconcile these what we what I thought were two truths? Right. Government being positive institution and change, but also practically, um, you know, being corrupt or, or not working for the, the public interest or the interest of the people. So, right. If it's by the people and for the people, why don't we change it for the better? Why don't we get more involved and participate in the democratic system to make it a better place? So uh, just as a little bit of uh, uh, preface and and uh, oh, how would I say uh um, beginning to this uh, presentation, uh, and knowing here we have an audience of folks who really care about uh, civic engagement and being politically engaged, um, I thought it was important to uh, to contextualize the environmental issues in terms of um, having that challenge before us, but the opportunity to the, to do to do better uh, both in our society. Um, and human-made environment, political system, but also our natural environment. So with that said, uh, let me go ahead and pull up a slideshow and uh, show you a little bit what I want to talk about today, okay? So we'll go ahead and um, make sure, um, uh, well, is that okay? Can everybody see that or should I put it in presentation mode? Maybe presentation mode might help. Okay. Are y'all ready for this? So ready. <laughs> okay. Tuesday topics, earth and environment. Um, been a proud lobbyist for the Kansas Sierra Club, as Carol said, for the last 10 years. The reason I got into environment is because I thought it was a uh, uh, public policy. There's a lot of issues you can focus on, but one issue that drew to me uh, was one because of my background and, and growing up uh, in Linwood, Kansas. Uh, this sunset on the left is uh, the view from right outside of where I'm um, streaming from today uh, on our family farm um, and uh, just incredible. Uh, but also the, the human element of this. I thought, well, environment's a common denominator for all people. 
It should be, right? We all depend on our environment. We all have to uh, have clean air and clean water. So that's uh, something that connects, should connect us all, no matter what walks of life. We all need food in our bodies and uh, water to nourish ourselves and all that. So I thought, well, what other issue can I impact a, a wide variety of people than working on environmental issues? Now, we know practically over the years, uh, we've had an issue of environmental uh, injustice in the sense that some of those that are um, uh, uh, more oppressed or uh, less afforded privilege or opportunity in our society, both nationally and globally, have been faced with more environmental injustice. We put them next to the landfill or the power plant, the dirty power plant. They don't get the same opportunity to uh, prosper economically to maybe lift themselves out of poverty or their environmental struggles, et cetera. So I thought, well, if I wanna try to make a difference, which I really do for, for my place, my community, my home here in Kansas, why don't I try to work on environmental issues? So I went through school and then uh, shortly after school looking for a job, my mom cut an ad out of the paper for environmental lobbyists. Thank you, mom. I said, ma, it's a long shot, but this is a dream job. And I came into the interview with one basic message. Yeah, I might not be the most experienced coming out of school, but I think where there's a will, there's a way. And I'll tell you, as a generation is going to face the most uh, consequence from environmental uh, legacy, uh, both good and bad, I will take it upon myself to work harder than anybody else. So that's that was my promise. I've been trying to live up to it uh, for the past 10 years and try to get, get a little bit smarter and more experienced along the way. Now, I show these pictures here that you'll see. Because it, it really, as Carol said, you know, we all encounter our environment every day uh, for drinking. We are made of water for our food and nourishment to keep ourselves going, basic necessity of life for recreation and enjoyment. There's a couple uh, uh, rowing, uh, canoeing down the Wakarusa River, not too far away from me, uh, for our energy and for our agriculture. And then also for inspiration and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a sense of moral compass. You know, I'll ask the legislators in Topeka, think about, I'll ask all of you today, think about the most beautiful place you've ever been. Okay. And I ask, does that happen to be outside? You know, is it in nature? What is it about being in the environment that strikes a chord deep within us? that inspires us or motivates us or gives us calm um, to uh, provide a sanctuary for us. So think about that a little bit. I think it's a little bit because of our biology, because it's innate within us that we are part of the nature and because of the nourishment it provides. But unfortunately, we can't say the same for everyone of having the, the opportunity uh, for nourishment, uh, for a sanctuary. Um, I don't know if anyone caught this program last night on ABC News, and it was also on, I think, a, a Nightline. Uh, but I encourage you to go to ABC News and see the story David Muir and the, and the news team ABC did on Madagascar and the famine that they're facing um, because of climate change. I thought it was really um, interesting that for a, a country, island country that uses um, has an impact of 0.01% of carbon in it, global carbon emissions. They're one of the uh, societies first facing some of the severe um, hardship and tragedy that is coming with the climate crisis. As these uh, little kids um, with the, um, the world um, for their future uh, are, are struggling with malnourishment and uh, a lack of food. Um, people dying and uh, just a, a shame that for folks that aren't part of the problem are certainly facing the consequences of our um, environmental catastrophe across the world. So I thought that was really important and kind of put a, um, some faces to our global problem. So those the folks that are nervous about not having a solar farm next to them uh, or, or you know, nervous about having a solar farm next to them or, or don't like seeing the wind turbines or um, using more resources than they should. It's, it's good to remind ourselves we're not alone, that we share this planet, our one home uh, with others. 
and they don't have it as well as we do. So our actions every day, our collective actions um, do have an impact. So I thought that was good to ground ourselves there. Um, Y'all probably know this, this is maybe a little bit review, but as far as the challenges and opportunities as I see it, a big one is pollution. And that pollution is, is widespread, both environmental pollution, what we're putting into the air, putting in the water, um, and contaminating soils, the uh, ecosystems of the land with uh, plastic and other trash and litter. That's one thing. But also, I think we're facing a, a, a wider pollution of our minds. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. Resource depletion, the number one environmental uh, issue in Kansas, I always say, is... Water, water. We have less than 20 years of water supply or, or even less for certain areas of, of Western Kansas. We have a water issue where our water is continually being compromised both with depletion uh, supply wise, but quality and contamination. Uh, we got blue green algae, over 100 uh, water bodies in Kansas have been uh, polluted uh, with uh, heavy uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and nutrient overload that cause toxic algae blooms that um, can get um, mammals sick, um, both humans and animals, uh, disrupt the ecosystems and starve the oxygen supply of the water, creating dead zones, but also uh, ruin recreational opportunities. We got folks in Kansas really excited to spend their uh, time with their family going to Milford Lake and then it's shut down because of toxic blue-green algae. That's lost, lost uh, opportunity, uh, mem memories for people, but also recreation uh, for the state of Kansas. That's uh, big money for those uh, tourism communities that count on that. Um, so water is a big part of the resource depletion, but also we're losing critical uh, soil that erodes from the land, gets washes off and, and set, uh, creates sediment in our reservoirs, but also lost farm ground uh, that we, we need to grow crops to uh, uh, feed ourselves, but also uh, return um, the, uh, the, uh, the carbon in, that we're releasing in the atmosphere back in the soil. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I think that there's a real problem with uh, kind of individual mindset as opposed to broader collect, uh, collective public good. And so it's more about me. And we saw during the pandemic, people were um, fighting with each other and fussing about not being able to get their Subway sandwich or the liberties that they're so excited about normal wise, but they didn't think about, well, a pandemic caused uh, extreme circumstances uh, cause for a, a change of the game plan and adaptation. And so, you know, we lost um, thousands of uh, people here in Kansas. Um, I don't need to uh, tell you that. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in our country, one of the worst affected by the pandemic. And I, I really think there was this too much concentration on individualism versus the collective good and, and doing uh, taking um, upon ourselves for sacrifice for each other. I mean, it's about the golden rule, treating each other as like we like to be treated, but also knowing that when we help society out, when we help others out, it helps our situation too. So there is a, a selfish aspect a little bit to uh, a better humanity. And so um, I think, uh, you know, what do they say? Um, you know, as we, uh, in, you know, all boats rise or increase, uh, the opportunity for all to succeed and prosper. So uh, anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a big issue I think we need to turn around. Of course, we got the League of Women Voters and other uh, crucial organizations across the uh, state trying to do better for enhancing the public good, participating in our democracy, helping our environment, uh, et cetera, um, public health issues, uh, the list goes on. So appreciate all that, but um, just that's a societal flaw as I see it. Of course, inequity and justice affect. We got a number of people uh, making uh, a, a collective amount of money as the bottom 50% uh, that we continue to have uh, systemic racism uh, in America. We have violence. Uh, all those things, I, I think, are flaws in the system where we could have a better future. Um, we could be ecological. It, it, 
emphasis on the logic part of this thing. If we use natural intelligence and base our societies and our systems on the uh, ecology that provides for us, the, the natural uh, a way of, of things have gone like um, many ancestors of ours uh, had practiced for so long. And then we thought, well, maybe because of ego or uh, technological opportunity that we can make a better life by um, going, coming up with our own solutions that kind of counteract nature. That's that's uh, uh, gotten us to a place where we're polluting, we're re re uh, depleting our resources at unprecedented rates, and it's um, it, we're thinking we're better than nature as opposed to thinking of ourselves grounded in nature as a part of nature and how we can complement nature by utilizing nature as a model. So uh, we need peace and harmony, and hopefully we'll get that in our lifetimes. Um, how can we can't solve our problems through cooperation uh, versus violence? Uh, that's that's a pending <laughs> issue that you think we'd be smart enough to figure that out by now. Um, let fossils be fossils, okay? So fossil fuels, let's keep them in the ground. Why do we uh, are mining the aquifer? That's million year old water when we could be utilizing systems that take the water that we get in renewables, uh, whether it's energy or replenishment of natural recharge of, of, of uh, our surface waters, et cetera. We need to get back to basics. I hope the pandemic has reminded us that, that it's about a fundamental of our relationships, both to each other as people, but also to the environment for which we depend on. And we're gonna have to change both our behavior, okay? First and foremost, maybe some of the convenience we've, we've created through artificial means uh, in our way of life today, but um, change those things to realize we may have to have some sacrifice. We may have to wear masks around each other as annoying as those could be to keep them on your face uh, from time to time. We may have to socially distance during a public health emergency. We might have to cut back on um, vacations or, or trips we take in our fossil fuel cars or, or cut back on some of those luxuries of life to see the long-term impact we might have to make. So there's that behavior, but let's also embrace technological solutions that are both win-win for society in terms of justice and also uh, justice for the planet. Okay, that was a lot of time on that one slide without any pictures, sorry about, but really important to ground ourselves here. Here's the problems. We see it here, we're, we're increasingly trashing our planet. There's plastic we pulled out of a nearby river outside of Wichita. Look at all that. We're releasing uh, mylar balloons out in, into, you know, on celebration or commemoration and all that. But we think about where those balloons end up. I find multiple out here in the woods right behind my house of the, of the plastic. With the plastic we use uh, and the items we use every day, where are they going? Well, they're ending up in our oceans, in our ecosystems. We got to do something about that. There, we're sending uh, our recycling to places across the world to be recycled when 10% of the plastic across the world actually gets recycled. We need to do something about this right away. You know, it's really amazing that we've only had uh, plastics, you know, really predominantly in our society for the last 50 years or so, maybe 60 or so, but we've had more plastics get produced in the last 10 years and 20 years than we've ever had plastics. So it keeps getting worse as we hope for convenience and, and all that. No, it's, it's really not convenient for our ecosystems or planet. It's really wasteful and tragic. That ends up in our water bodies as well as the other pollution that we're creating, industrial pollution. If you look at that uh, picture at the bottom right, isn't it amazing to where our rivers can actually catch on fire? Many of you might recall that picture. You know what it is? Feel free to say it if you're interested, but does anybody know? Cleveland? Cleveland. Yeah, it's the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. So yes, all the industrial pollution that was going on into that river. And I go to Lake Erie every year for a family reunion. And it's amazing to think that as I go over the Cuyahoga, 
Guyahoga River that we can pollute our river so much to where they actually can catch on fire. Water's not supposed to catch on fire. We're supposed to put out the fire. <laughs> so, you know, we got something really wrong. Fortunately, that spawned the Clean Water Act. Um, you know, all the pollution that we had in the uh, the seven uh, in the sixties and seventies in terms of air and the smog we were able to see uh, caused the Clean Air Act, which was good. I'll mind you that was passed uh, by a Republican president. I keep that in, in mind because environment should be a nonpartisan or bipartisan issue, right? It connects us all, so it shouldn't be a political football as it is. Um, but uh, just on industrial pollution, um, remind ourselves that, you know, we had six major pollutants that we uh, ended up regulating in 1970. Ozone, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide. Those were causing significant health problems like heart disease and heart attacks, respiratory issues, asthma, uh, cancer, reproductive harm, and even mature, uh, immature death. That air pollution, uh, according to Dr. Larry Erickson, former K-State professor uh, and a, a state organization, Kansas Natural Resource Council president, which I'm at, at, on the board of, says the social cost of air pollution around the world is $3 trillion a year. $3 trillion a year, and yet we're, we're um, uh, nervous about a generational investment in, in $2 trillion or $3 trillion that the uh, president wants to do. Uh, come on, I mean, it's already costing us in a lot of different ways, not just our bottom dollar, but also in our quality of life and well-being. But about those six pollutants, in the past, um, because regulating those pollutants in, since 1990, the past 30 years, carbon monoxide has fell 74%, lead dropped 97% overall, Nitro, nitrogen dioxide was cut in half. Ozone was down, particulate matter decreased by 26%, and sulfur dioxide fell 89%. So I give that away to say, hey, we've done this. We've been through this before. Where we take action and implement laws to safeguard society, we can have positive effects. Think about the whole no zone and the carbon floor. Uh, fluorocarbons, the CFCs that we're releasing. Think about how uh, Kansas almost lost its um, bald eagle population. We didn't have a, a nest in our state um, uh, since 1989, and now we have bald eagles uh, back, you know, because we uh, cut down some of our, our uh, contamination and toxic pollution. So I say all those things that we have had success in the past, and we can create success in the future. Uh, this picture up here, uh, this is another way we're polluting our environment, but by uh, uh, concentrating our, our um, animal feeding operations and using industrial agriculture, we thought that would help things be more efficient, uh, that we can provide uh, food to greater masses at a lesser cost, but we're not um, considering the full cost of some of these actions. It's created long-term pollution and a really uh, devastating, I think, tragic way of, of growing our food in Kansas. We're a top 10 agriculture state. Beef is one of our uh, top commodities, but when are we going to start thinking about uh, uh, beef, not just the meat part, but in terms of cows and, and the well-being of, of their life and how they can nourish the land by grazing uh, our agriculture and, and, and being a, a natural uh, mower for our crops and, and, uh, and uh, or being a ruminant animal as opposed to concentrating that in one place where um, and, and some would say maybe as a concentration camp for, for animals. Uh, here's the, some of the, the blue-green algae that I mentioned uh, and, the, and the picture on the right with the, the system of, of uh, or the impact on, on aquatic ecosystems and dead fish. <clears throat> here's the political division based on mistruths, and I think this is really important and a key element where we rely on the League of Women Voters to help out because you know, we saw firsthand about how um, the, the mistruths can create um, really devastating consequences. Uh, we had an attack on our capital but, uh, by our own citizens. Um, such a shame. For what? 
um, because of they thought the election was stolen again, based on uh, false uh, pretenses and all that. Uh, that we've had uh, people die in the continuing of the pandemic because of lack of consideration of science uh, and public health officials and all that. So this is this is really dangerous uh, when we have uh, um, a lack of informed uh, public citizenry. Right, that's something that the founding fathers um, and uh, founding mothers too can't forget about them behind the scenes um, trying to make a, a America uh, from the beginning there um, uh, at, at the at the beginning of the Constitution and some of those things climate I don't want to get too much into the gloom and doom right because I want to focus on the opportunities here but just to put it in perspective we had uh, some of the worst uh, uh, climate disasters uh, last year, the, the uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration keeps track of billion dollar related disasters from extreme weather and climate issues. Uh, we broke the record last year. Um, this year, we're on pace to breaking the record again. Uh, these are the wildfires in the West to a record level hurricane season we had last year. Severe storms. It wasn't too long ago we remember the drought in Kansas that at the same time uh, we had flooding in a different part of our state, volatile, uh, volatile temperature swings, et cetera. So um, this is, impacts our lives and our, our ability to be resilient in our communities, in our own homes. Uh, in the last 10 years, Kansas has faced 42, 42 climate events that have cost us $20 billion collectively okay so doing something proactively investing to try to mitigate climate change and adapt is something we ought to be doing right away okay um here are the carbon emissions uh, by sector i think all oh, that's pretty good to remind ourselves that a third of it is from electricity about a third of it is from uh, industry and if you lump agriculture in there as well and then also for transportation and it's burning of fossil fuels. There's no uh, disagreement about it at this point, other than climate deniers who are uh, less than 1% of the scientific community, okay? But practically, we got um, too many public leaders and too many of our uh, citizenry that have been hoodwinked uh, by this propaganda. So we need to do something about correcting the record here and realizing that we can do, we need to do something about it. Even um, if, you know, it doesn't have as much payoff as what we'd like to hope, we have to do something about it. We have a moral obligation to do something about it uh, to help our, our improve our lives. But also we will have success, as we said, if, if we actually act as opposed to holding ourselves back. So um, here are the ways that, Industrial, I put the picture of industrial agriculture, and it's a big effect for Kansas specifically. Agriculture is one of our predominant economic sectors, as we know, one of our largest industries. Um, but unfortunately, what that's done is that as that industry has grown and evolved, we've actually decreased the opportunity for people uh, and farmers here in Kansas is the size of the farm has decreased significantly. We lost thousands of farms in Kansas in the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years uh, because of the way we've industrial. It's gotten bigger on the farm size with less people on it. That's not good, especially when we can put people to work in growing uh, healthy and local foods for us. Um, uh, and, you know, we've produced uh, food crops, well, crops that we don't actually eat. So we use so much of our land, you know, 21 million acres of farmland, when it only take a, a hundred thousand or 200,000 acres to actually grow the fruits and vegetables that our state needs on an annual basis. Yet we import over 90%, closer to 95% of our fruits and vegetables every year. We're a top 10 ag state. Why are we importing so much of the food that should be half of our plate? according to the USDA, fruits and vegetables, especially for our kids. Um, so we need to kind of recalibrate uh, our agriculture system. And that's what I'm trying to get across here. But doing so will hopefully retain people on the land in those rural communities so we don't have a continual rural depopulation problem as we've seen. You know about the census, 80 counties of the 105 lost population, most of those being rural here in Kansas. Okay. 
few more slides. I want to go into opportunities here, and then we'll go into questions and answers. So thanks for hanging with me. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. This is really important because the environmental issues um, are, are a tough challenge here for Kansas, a vast uh, challenge that we have. Irrigation. A lot of people don't know that irrigation accounts for 85% of the water consumption here in Kansas. Okay. The way I like to remember it is 85% of the state's water is used by 15%, 85 plus 15 is 100, that's an easy way for me to remember it, 15% of the state's farmers. So 15% of the state's farmers, okay, irrigators, are using 85% of the state's water more than all of our cities and towns in industries, non-agriculture combined. Let that sink in. I told you about a visit late here, the High Plains Aquifer, which covers Kansas, Ogallala, and, and uh, a number of other states, Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska, parts of Colorado. We've drained the equivalent of Lake Erie underground. I can't even see uh, the other side of the lake. Okay, it's 200 miles long, 40 miles wide or so. And, you know, in some places, 200 foot deep, you know, 50 foot uh, deep in a lot of places of Lake Erie. Think about that. If you ever seen that Great Lake or, or compared to Great Lakes, we're draining that underground and, and million year old water aquifer. It's a, just a shame that aquifer declines feet uh, every year. Here's a, a picture of Northwest Kansas uh, uh, on the Rickery River. I think this is like uh, 1996. Here's 2006. Okay, so impacting our groundwater supplies also impacts our surface waters as well. We've lost streams in Kansas. That's what it looked used to look like on the left, and then you can see uh, what it looks like uh, on the right, and and probably even worse. And in, in, uh, if I were to get a, <laughs> a recent uh, uh, image of, of stream loss in Kansas, okay? Really uh, interesting here that 22% um, of the water is used by the top 150 water users, okay? The irrigators in the state. Um, so I, I just think that's a, a really amazing. And for something that should be a public resource, maybe we can have some of those um, top irrigators using more than their fair share, pay a little bit of price premium to give back to either their county or to the state for critical water programs. So we make sure that, that that's uh, available for everyone because right now I have a hard time stomaching the idea that a lot, most of our water is being used for private gain and private profit as opposed to public interest and public good. Even if farming is a noble enterprise, right? And I get it. I grow fruits and or uh, I, you know, grow vegetables. I grew up on a farm and all that stuff. The son of a pig farmer, etc. Even if it is a noble enterprise, we should be doing everything we can to make it better and be a better steward of the land. Here's uh, some of the communities in, in western Kansas uh, that have seen decreased uh, aquifer decline and, uh, in result, have you know, 20 years or less. Uh, for their uh, uh, water supply. And it directly overlaps with the active water rights. We've overappropriated water rights um, over the decades and that's uh, ca causing a significant problem for us. So we need to be ecological. Hopefully this will be get, uh, getting to the positive elements of how we can make change here in Kansas. Cause there is where the challenge is vast, the opportunity is, is vast too. We could use waterless clean energy. Kansas is one of the top uh, states for clean energy resources, right? We're a top uh, state for wind, but also a top state for solar. We have uh, just as much sunshine, sunny days as Florida, believe it or not. Maybe not the same types of beaches, uh, which, uh, you know, it, what... Uh, you know, we, we got the Flint Hills, so they can't, they don't got nothing on that and other ecological places in Kansas, but uh, sure, we got beaches for the lake, et cetera, and all that, but uh, just amazing we have so much sunshine. Here's how we're going to uh, create the clean energy transition in Kansas. We're going to retire these 
uh, dirty and expensive coal plants. I'm tired of paying Wyoming for our energy sources. We can be putting money in our own pocket in terms of wind, solar, and storage. We don't want natural gas. We saw earlier uh, this year in February what natural gas reliance uh, is about. Yeah, it kept us, uh, some of us warm in the short term, but it, it leads to fracking and man-made earthquakes that I know the league has uh, studied previously. Um, it's causing methane pollution to go up in our air, creating a, a, a worsening problem for our atmosphere and uh, the climate change. Um, and it's not reliable, it's expensive. Uh, prices went up and we're paying, gonna be paying the cost for that uh, for uh, the next decade. Um, or more uh, in terms of costs on our electric bills. Uh, so we can increase energy efficiency and conservation of energy in our state. We're one of the bottom states. Um, we're currently ranked 47th of all states in terms of energy efficiency programs. And that's big because there's thousands of people that get their power disconnected every year because they can't afford to pay their utility bill. What we've, we found is uh, through some of our analysis of Sierra Club, we saw that on average, uh, those facing energy burden, the cost, the impact of their electric bill on their household income, minority communities uh, like our Black population and our Latina population in Kansas on average have a twice as high or three times as high of an energy burden where they're paying closer to 6% of their household income on electricity and energy use versus um, a, a white, um, an average white household. So there you go, environmental justice right there. Um, and if they get their power disconnected, it's a lot harder to help themselves and their families out in terms of uh, securing a job, uh, providing the, the uh, home, um, you know, healthcare and, and all the other things we try to do. Try turning your power off for a few days and see how uh, much of a struggle it is for to try to do the things you need to do to succeed in life. So I, I think we can try to use energy efficiency and conservation to help those people most burdened by electric uh, issues in Kansas, the, both the pollution side, but also the cost burden side. Um, I talked a little bit about renewables. We're gonna need a clean infrastructure in terms of transportation and electric vehicles is a big part of that. And then also energy storage, which will help those intermittent resources like wind and solar um, be base load power um, for uh, all of Kansas so we can store that energy when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Our largest public utility is making steps towards that. This is a little bit of their plan generation where they plan to add uh, of 4,200 megawatts of clean energy over the next 20 years. Well, we need it closer to 10 or 15 years, and we need closer to 7,000 or 8,000 megawatts of clean energy power so we can totally reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and get this, save Kansans money. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars um, every, uh, per the, well, we've lost hundreds of millions of dollars in the past several years by relying on coal power. And then the more we keep those running, we're going to keep losing hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? Just because coals is more expensive than wind or slow, uh, solar in today's time. And that's not counting the economic uh, multiplier that comes with, um, uh, with economic investment and, and jobs and et cetera. So uh, we need to do a lot more. We can use wind as a success. In 20 years time, wind went but from being just a blip on the radar in terms of energy production for Kansas to our number one source of, of energy uh, for electricity today, just in 20 years. Billions of dollars investments in the state, thousands of dollars of jobs, 40% reduction of CO2 in that time. Uh, it's just been incredible. We could do the same with wind and solar. I'm gonna skip this. This is a, a little bit about uh, how coal makes up about half, almost half of our supply generation. Composting. So you saw all those pictures of plastic and the pollution that we're seeing. Composting is a sweet spot that Kansas can really take its agricultural roots, marry them with the manufacturing and, and engineering processes to where we use biodegradable uh, land nourishment, nutritious 
goods as our products as opposed to just burying it underground or letting it get into our oceans like what is plastic and burning of fossil fuels to create that product. So we can do a lot more composting is a big way to help solve the issue. Uh, I, I think both in your backyard, the bottom left to the top right, which is industrial composting facility. Look at that, we can add that back to the land as a natural fertilizer. Again, utilizing nature as a model, return it back to the land composition um, and utilizer instead of synthetic fertilizers, which for the agriculture sector, just a report came out that amounts to 20% of our agricultural emissions is from synthetic fertilizers, okay? Carbon farming, and this is the uh, last set of slides here coming up. Thanks for bearing with me. We'll get to questions and answers here in just a moment. But utilizing nature's processes, as I mentioned earlier, the carbon farming, sequestering carbon, taking plants that absorb the carbon in the air um, out there that we're producing, bring it in in a natural way, putting it in the roots where that carbon can be productive in ground um, as a food. It will help um, protect the soil, we get on the land, we use natural fertilizers, we partner with nature, including domestic animals. It creates a diversity uh, for as far as uh, plant community and plant life, just like we know diversity is good for human systems. It can also be good for ecological systems too. We know that, we just need to do it. Here's what, some ways that we can incorporate what is called regenerative agriculture, carbon farming, consider it sustainable agriculture, something that the Kansas Rural Center uh, with supporters have, have worked on uh, for decades now help improve water quality as well, and water retention in our soil is important uh, uh, and overlap in the water issues. But we also realize that we make a connection just like we do with recycling and how far we've come in recycling. It take a little bit, but we realize that our food comes from the ground and the better ground we have in terms of soil health, we have better food. And when we use that food for actual food that go in our stomachs, not for animal stomachs all the time or ethanol or high fructose corn syrup in a semi-arid climate that we need to mine the aquifer for. Don't let me go on. We need to produce healthy foods locally, sustainably in our communities that can put people back to work like the guy on the right. It can uh, um, inspire and nourish our, our future, our current and future generations like the picture on the left. And young. It's delicious, by the way. <laughs> it makes us feel good. All those things that will help cut uh, health care costs long term and risk for diabetes and all that stuff if we eat that. Plus, we support our own local communities by putting more of our dollar uh, back into those neighbors and friends and community members that are doing right by the planet in sustainable agriculture, but also taking time and effort out of their lives. A lot of hard work and to put food on the table for us uh, that not all of us are, are able to do um, in backyard or have access to land. We need to make that land access more equitable too. So under um, served populations uh, also have access to land like many white people had um, for a long time with free land and, and property of value uh, access and all that stuff um, should be made to uh, uh, my increasing minority farmers as well. Okay, wow, doesn't that look great? Day out on the farm, that looks nice. And that help, soil is increasing, uh, get better and better all the time. I notice there's a little Jayhawk in front. Don't be alarmed, K-State fans. You know, we're equal opportunity here <laughs> for our colleges. And last, just a little bit of hope since it's relevant right now. There's a new opportunity right now. We're trying to turn the corner. You see me a lot of the climate change stuff there at uh, Glasgow, uh, uh, the climate. Uh, negotiations going on. A lot is happening at the federal level. We'll try to do what we can here at the state level. Trying to, uh, President Biden is trying to tackle the climate crisis. Let's give the president our support. Only so often do we have those really historical investments in the next generation uh, as far as infrastructure and all that. So we need to do that uh, right away. Here's some of the things he's been doing. Um, I'll, I'll skip that one for the sake of time. 
but a, a broad based uh, ex in infrastructure expansion, but also social infrastructure we've been here now can help our, uh, our quality of life and our economy at the same time. And don't let me forget, remember political mistruths based uh, uh, political division, um, all that's really important why we need the league to continue uh, doing it, what you do and inform the citizenry, um, inspire people to get engaged in the system and uh, everything from being at the Capitol in Topeka to uh, having talks with friends, um, listening, listening. That's why I like that picture in the top left. Listening is key. Uh, what's going on, respect that we got more in common than we do different. And what are our values, right? We all want to try to live a good life. We all want to try to enjoy this time and place that we share with each other. Okay, let's not forget that. And uh, we, th we think a little bit more about the collective good. I think we'll, we'll be able to make it. So, okay, I know that was a lot. Hey, thank you for your patience and attention. You know, uh, uh, I hope it was okay. Y'all got me inspired and going to talk about some of these things. Be happy to take some questions. Mary Lou, I hope I didn't uh, cut the time too short for questions here. No, Zach, but uh, please know that uh, the comments made by many of our members they're uh, very much in tune to what the situation is in regards to climate control and the situations we're, we're looking at. Uh, several of the comments were in regards to Western Kansas irrigation, uh, recalibrating our ag system. What's the state legislature, Ag and Natural Resources Committee, what are they doing in regards to recalibrating the ag system in regards to all of these complex questions, irrigation, uh, wind energy. And I know you've touched on that. And I'm from an area right now that's getting a wind farm that has split the community. And most of that energy generated is going out of state. So is it actually making a positive uh, impact for, for Kansas? Um, what's the sustainable agriculture uh, prognosis for us in regards to crops. Uh, are we going to have to change totally from wheat, corn, beans, whatever? Uh, and uh, what is the increased climate expectation in Kansas? Uh, how are we going to uh, address that in regards to uh, the next 10, 20 years? What, what's the legislature doing? What's the Kansas legislature? We know there's USDA programs for farmers mm -hmm. to try and recalibrate some of this. What's Kansas specifically doing? Yeah. Well, uh, hey, those are some really good uh, uh, questions and topics. I'm glad we can dive in a little bit more. Let me start with the legislature and kind of political arena first, and then I'll go into the specific issues a little bit more. Um, for, you know, I think I think both parties are realizing now. I know that um, you know some have vested interests, both on both sides, but uh, vested interests in keeping things the same because some um, of the constituents are profiting and doing well uh, off of uh, what I would consider exploitation, either of other people or uh, ecological resources. Okay. Um, so there's some interests that have profited and, and been empowered because of, of that uh, system, uh, uh, I think, an uh, outdated system. If we can uh, create more win-win opportunities and have those both traditional power holders, you know, a big agricultural lobby, uh, oil and gas, et cetera, that are dominant players in the state house um, to help lead um, in themselves a better future by recalibrating and being accountable for the exploitation or um, uh, the, the devastation that they've done, okay? So there's some ownership and accountability that needs to take in um, there. You know, we need to, uh, if we're asking more of others, we need to think, look ourselves in the mirror, what we can do to change our own actions. And so that's what I'm hoping for our agriculture industry, our in energy industries, et cetera, um, that have been our major polluters and all that. OK. And so but I say that and so that we're going to have to ground those interests, those powerful interests 
in thinking about the public interest and that those things need to change. And yes, we need your help to get there to a better future. So I know that's somewhat of a general generality there, but let me say this, the legislature is starting to get it. And that's because it's costing us so much, okay? In terms of agricultural loss because of extreme weather, okay? Um, the, the opportunity cost from not investing in clean energy and all that. Okay. So I think they're starting to get it. I've seen more momentum on water this year versus maybe the last five years in Kansas. Wow. We've had water committees and all that stuff, but I'm hearing more from the uh, chairman, uh, Ron Highland. I'm, I'm hearing more from uh, Lindsey Vaughn, uh, that are on the, at the water committees and they're saying, well, I'm seeing more from the agencies and say that we need a water plan that recognizes climate change, that actually, instead of just voluntary efforts that have, have been successful, but limited, that we have uh, government be a referee and blow the whistle and actually regulate some of this pollution going forward. So I'm seeing some more thinking, realistic thinking of what we need to do. And that's coordination, uh, but that's also some new tools to help conserve water. So that's just on the water. And I know, I think the, the league, if I'm correct here, has a presentation on a water panel coming up. I think, uh, I thought maybe I caught November 6th coming up. So um, if, uh, uh, I hope that's right. I got a, I got a message about it. I'm gonna try to attend because I wanna hear what those public leaders are saying about the most important environmental issue uh, for Kansas and water. Um, Sustainable agriculture could help. Um, to your point, Mary Lou, yeah, there'll be some changes of crops. There'll be some changes of irrigation practices. So we don't just spray the water up in the air, let it evaporate, and some of it hits the land. We don't just assume that things are dry because they look dry, but we're actually testing the soil moisture in the ground to see if it actually is thirsty for water or that part of the land is thirsty, but not this part of the land. So let's just focus our uh, water on that land, but also uh, thinking about, well, if given the climate's changing, what are our crops that are gonna be able to survive um, the temperature swings and be productive? And should we use more crops for actually putting food on the table <laughs> than, than an ethanol industry and all that. So I think there is hope on sustainable agriculture. We're seeing a lot more USDA programs recognize that some uh, practices have more carbon benefits and all that stuff. So there's that, but we should do more of that on the state level too. And I think there's increasing appetite to do those things. Kansas is number one state for no-till agriculture. Hmm. Believe it or oh. not, in terms of no-till acres. Okay, Good. we made that a priority and now we're in the lead on that. We should be the number one state for cover crops too. We're not. We should be the number one uh -huh. state for composting programs. We're not. But those are all opportunities. I think we just thought these things a little bit different, recalibrated the system. Uh, we can make a lot of positive gains. Climate expectations. Okay, you brought that up, Mary Lou. We got a climate denier uh, who, you know, um, leading our Senate Utilities Committee. Okay, Mike Thompson, it's no, yeah. it's no secret. He's proud to be a climate denier, apparently. And uh, it's too bad because someone that uh, many of us in Northeast Kansas trusted for years, decades, mm -hmm. has uh, given us the weather to, that we can depend on for the day. He's got the wrong forecast now for our future. OK, he's a little too calm during the storm. That is the climate emergency. OK, he needs to set aside or uh, get come to terms with the scientific consensus, uh, both the scientific community and climate science uh, with the armed services, understanding that uh, Department of Defense recognizes climate change is real and something that presents a national security issue to even the American Meteorological Society. Uh, right? The, the, the professionals that say, yeah, climate change is real to do something about that. He's an obstacle right now, but that's not, a, um, I want to say that I don't want to give up on him. And I just reached out to him the other day because I think there are common ground issues like energy conservation that we should uh, be able to agree on. I also am nervous seeing the countryside about the industrialization, right, of, of our landscapes more 
industrial energy out there, more blinking lights at night, you know, more wind turbines when we could, or uh, solar panels when it could be a furry. But think about the canyons that are carved or the, the forests that are removed in Appalachia, canyons that are carved in Wyoming where we're getting our coal. At least Kansas can do something positively before our state, for our country, and for our planet. So we need to do something about that. Think about a remind uh, about the kids in Madagascar. Remember, if we think about, well, you know what? I'll deal with blinking lights at night. If that helps turn the tide on the climate and we can help uh, uh, ourselves and folks across the world with sustainable agriculture, we can do a lot there. So, sorry, I, I you know, hey, you got me wound up. We can go on. I, I, want, I just want to say before we run out of time here that how much I appreciate all of you, thanks for your attention today, but all what you do in your communities and to help make Kansas a better place and be civically active. So uh, thank you for that. Hey, as far as I'm concerned, we're all teammates here uh, for a better future. So let's keep doing on it, keep doing it. We're going to need every everyone and their neighbors and their friends to get out there and uh, showcase our concern, our public concern, because most of us understand the perils of the climate. Most of us understand we need to do something about water and our, our you know, and all these things and, and we'll leave a better future uh, for our children and all that stuff. So if that's the majority opinion, how come it's not being done in Topeka? So that's why we need all of us to help voice the concern and vote, et cetera. So thank you very much. Zach, thank you. Um, uh, your passion and your honesty and your optimism are much mm -hmm. appreciated. Let's mm -hmm. stay in touch. Mm -hmm. okay. You bet. You bet. Mm -hmm. At your service. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.